Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Dr. Ethan Russo. Dr. Russo is a board-certified neurologist, psychopharmacology researcher, and author. He is the founder and CEO of CredoScience.com. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Massachusetts Medical School before residencies in pediatrics in Phoenix, Arizona, and in child and adult neurology at the University of Washington in Seattle, in a practice with a strong chronic pain component. In 1995, he pursued a three-month sabbatical doing ethnobotanical research with the Machaguena people in Parquet Nacional de Manu, Peru. He has held faculty appointments in pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Montana, in medicine at the University of Washington, and as a visiting professor at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Harvard University, and John Hopkins University. He has also published numerous book chapters and over 50 articles in neurology, pain management, cannabis, and ethnobotany. His research interests have included correlations of historical uses of cannabis to modern pharmacological mechanisms, phytopharmaceutical treatment of migraine and chronic pain, herbal synergy and phytocannabinoid, terpenoid, serotonergic, and vanilloid interactions. He has consulted or lectured on these topics in 39 U.S. states and Canadian provinces and 39 countries. Now on to the show. Hi, Dr. Russo. Thank you for coming on the show today. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. I, uh, I wanted to ask you some questions uh, regarding some of your more recent research. Um, I know you've done some work with uh, Jeremy Plum, who was recently on the podcast. I thought maybe we could start off talking a little bit about that. Sure, that'd be great. Do you want to explain some of the uh, methodology um, and what you were looking to accomplish with Jeremy? Yeah, so what we were doing was uh, testing out a novel solventless extraction technique, uh, the idea idea being to try and preserve can cannabinoid and particularly terpenoid content of fresh flower. Um, and I should point out that uh, the source article is open source. It's available um, online at ethanrusso.org. If people just hit the library tab, it'll be about the second article down. Uh, so it's called Novel Solventless Extraction Technique to preserve cannabinoid and terpenoid profiles of fresh cannabis inflorescence. And um, so basically that was the idea. Um, what I was doing was operating under the uh, feeling that um, the standard way of presenting cannabis is to dry and cure it. And this is based on the idea that everyone is gonna smoke it, but that isn't always the case. Um, it's been known for many years that you lose up to 50% of the monoterpenoid content. So this would be the lower molecular weight terpenoids, the so-called headspace volatiles that are going to be what you smell when you're in the vicinity of a cannabis plant. So um, in drying and curing, you're losing 50% of those. Now, if you're a person like me that believes that they're part of the entourage of uh, cannabis chemicals that contribute to therapeutic effects, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So what we're doing is for the sake of so-called smokeability, we're squandering these important components, uh, not just smell and taste, but effect. Um, so I wanted to develop a technique that would preserve the profile of the fresh flower um, as you see it growing. Um, and this involves uh, exposure of the fresh cut flower uh, to CO2 vapor from dry ice. And um, we were hoping there'd be sort of a lyophilization, freeze drying effect as well, uh, get rid of some of the water. Apparently some of it remains. However, we did succeed quite well in demonstrating a uh, marked concentration uh, of the components, we could kick uh, the cannabinoid content upwards of 60% in some cases, and uh, basically double or triple the terpenoid fraction um, as compared to the fresh flower. 
Um, so what you end up with is uh, what the Moroccans term kif, um, basically separating the trichomes from the rest of the plant material. Now, when it comes to cannabis therapeutics, uh, aside from roots and some uh, things that occur in the, the leaves um, to a greater extent than in the flower, when usually we're most interested in the cannabinoids and uh, terpenoids uh, that occur in the trichomes. And the rest of what's in the flower is really extraneous. So you do have a bunch of um, uh, cell wall ballast uh, that's sort of fatty. You've got chlorophyll, which you don't need for therapeutic effects. And then there's all the mat woody material. Um, so basically, you're getting down to the nitty gritty of what's needed medicinally if you're just looking at trichomes. And that's basically the reason that there's been hashish uh, for thousands of years. Our ancestors uh, in the Middle East figured out a long time ago that the real action uh, was in the trichomes. Even if they couldn't see them at the time, they knew how to separate them from the rest of the biomass and create this concentrated product. Um, so this is a sort of modern type of hashish or keef. Um, but um, it was really important to me that we do this with material that was organically grown and under control conditions. So that's where Jeremy Plum came in because he has what, to my knowledge, is the most sophisticated indoor controllable organic regenerative um, approach to cannabis culture that I've ever seen. And believe me, I've seen a lot um, between working at GW and having visited numerous of the licensed producers in Canada, um, in the Netherlands, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so there are plenty of people growing cannabis. There are very few that I think are growing it the way I'd like to see it done. Uh, so with this process, um, how practical do you see this scaling commercially if it's a more efficient way of preserving, uh, you know, terpenes and, and, and everything in the process? Well, it's a great question and one that we're still trying to answer. As it is, um, this takes some time. Um, it may be, uh, we did different sessions, one was just with an hour of dry ice exposure and uh, we did two that way and two uh, with 48 hours of exposure. Now that's probably overkill. It may be that a happy medium is somewhere a few hours of exposure. Um, this does take some time. Um, there could be a marked cost savings, however, because with this process, you're not having to have a drying facility or take that time to dry. Uh, ostensibly, it'd be possible that you'd be from fresh flower to the finished cryokeef, as we call it, um, in just a few hours. Now, the yields are not fantastic, but depending on the chemo of our involved, we did see yields that were quite comparable to what people get with water hash. Now, water hash um, can be a very nice product. However, there are issues with it because you end up with a bunch of wastewater. And to my knowledge, it would not be very easy to, um, to fix that up and use it for another purpose. Um, and you also end up with, um, with that process with a bunch of sludgy uh, biomass material that again, may not be good for much except composting. With cryokeef, it's quite different, however. What you end up with is flour that has partially been denuded of its trichomes. However, as we tested all the material each step of the way, we know that that remaining uh, byproduct um, could also be extracted uh, by CO2 or cold ethanol. And so it's not wasted at all, which might be the case with water hash. So ultimately, what we'd end up with is this byproduct that's extractable, plus a, a high-quality extract, the cryokeef, which 
we believe would be useful in a number of fashions. On the one hand, it may be very attractive to the high-end uh, Keefe connoisseur market. Um, and so it could be, a, a, you know, uh, be sold at a premium. Additionally, for like pharmaceutical applications, this may be a much better way to go because again, what you're ending up with is a much purer product um, as your starting material. Um, you basically have got, uh, again, upwards of 60% uh, cannabinoids and hopefully uh, depending on the source material, somewhere uh, six or 7% terpenoids, and there probably is some uh, water left there, but you're not ending up with hundreds of extraneous chemicals that really aren't uh, contributing to the therapeutic effect. Um, so we, we think this will be viable, but you know it will be a specialty product. Um, uh, we haven't quite worked out all the economics, but we think it uh, could be a, a very good thing, uh, depending on the application. Can you touch a little bit on the uh, entourage effect and uh, its therapeutic benefits in regards to terpenes um, and how they may be like medically beneficial? Sure. Okay, so the entourage effect, uh, this term was coined in 1998 by professors Meshulam and Ben Shabbat in Israel. Now, originally they applied this to endocannabinoids. It was the idea that we have two main endogenous cannabinoids, anandamide and 2-arachidonoglycerol. And what they noted experimentally was that related molecules, the entourage, that seemingly were inactive or very had very poor activity on their own when combined with the main players, um, anandamide and 2-AG, uh, there was a markedly, markedly synergistic effect, uh, say on treating inflammation. The next year they published another article where they said, well, you know, this could apply to the plant as well. Um, and, you know, this keys into a concept that's been present in botanical medicine forever that, um, you know, there usually isn't one active component uh, or um, a key ingredient, but rather a collection of chemicals that work in concert um, to produce the desired effect. And, you know, that's sort of analogous as well to traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, where it's usually not a simple meaning one herb, but rather a combination of verbs. And so you might have two or three that are aiming at the pain, um, but you've got additional ones that improve the taste or reduce the side effect from the first three. Well, cannabis is like TCM or, or an entourage unto itself. We know that um, there are upwards of 150 different phytocannabinoids that the plant makes. Now, beyond the familiar THC and CBD, um, there are probably 10 others where we know a fair amount about the pharmacology. And each of these has unique therapeutic properties that are distinct from THC and CBD. Beyond that, you have the aromatic components of cannabis, the terpenoids, and there have been 200 different ones that have been described in cannabis. None so far are unique to cannabis, but they're common to other plants. Um, just to give a few examples, uh, limonene is going to be familiar to anyone who smelled citrus. Um, so limonene is at the base of the essential oils from all the citrus. Uh, whether it be orange, lemon, lime, kumquats even. Um, and uh, limonene is a well-tested uh, molecule and it has been shown in humans to have marked antidepressant effects. Um, and we've recently done experiments at Johns Hopkins with Ryan Vondre showing that limonene in conjunction with THC makes a significant decrease in the um, anxiety levels that THC can produce. So wow. that's one example. It's also, limonene is also an immune stimulating compound. 
Uh, myrcene. Myrcene is the most common uh, terpene that we find in cannabis. In conjunction with THC, it's very uh, soporific, uh, produces uh, fatigue. And it's what I like to call the couch lock compound. Um, so it really can be helpful for sleep in particular, but has anti-inflammatory properties as well. Linalool is common to cannabis and to lavender. Again, even in humans, linalool uh, or lavender essential oil has been shown to be a very effective anti-anxiety agent. And this has been demonstrated clinically in demented patients, patients with Alzheimer's disease that can get quite agitated, particularly at night. Um, so improvements in sleep, decreases in nursing care have been demonstrated. Um, and these things all are boosted um, by their association with THC, CBD, or others. Um, another example, and this is an interesting one, caryophylline um, occurs in cannabis. Um, it has the distinction of being not just a terpene, but a cannabinoid as well because it works on something called the CB2 receptor. CB2 is a non-intoxicating receptor that has pain relieving and anti-inflammatory effects. So having caryophylline along with THC and other components can make it a better drug for pain or, or inflammation. Uh, it also has an anti-addictive property. Um, and all this is work that's been amply demonstrated in basic science experiments. Um, so um, and those are just a few of the examples. Now, you will hear from people that the entourage effect isn't proven. Well, uh, there are plenty of examples, uh, whether they be now in humans or in animal work or in laboratory work uh, that demonstrate that uh, there is this entourage effect, there is synergy of these ingredients. So it's a bold statement. Um, you know, they're trying to prove the negative by saying that the entourage effect isn't proven. I just wonder how much evidence is gonna be sufficient for the doubters to come on board. Um, I mean, all anybody has to do is try Marinol, synthetic THC, and compare that to what herbal cannabis is like and it will be very self-evident uh, that these are two different uh, types of effects, different animals, if you, you will. Uh, THC on its own is not a pleasant experience. Um, it's more apt to produce dysphoria, unhappiness, than euphoria. And it's quite disorienting, even to people who are accustomed to use of cannabis, um, whereas, with these other components, they tend to tame THC and increase its therapeutic index, meaning increasing the, the allowable dose um, that can exert the therapeutic effects without producing side effects. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> one, one thing I thought of is the work of Dr. A.D. Ray and the Cannabis Cup in Oregon that Jeremy's also a part of, um, where they found that the sensory experience uh, by the judges was not necessarily like the highest THC cultivars were not the consistent winners. So consumers, even though were driven by uh, THC from a marketing perspective, um, from a consumer experience, sensor experience, the, the high THC cultivars are not the ones that are winning. So yeah. it fits sure. with what you're saying about this therapeutic experience, right. having all these other components to the plant. Um, along those lines, uh, as from a cultivation perspective, one of the questions that was given to me by, from a cultivator was, um, are there issues with unsafe levels in the case of making extracts in relation to uh, these terpenes? Uh, any potential long-term issues for workers that are being exposed um, on a daily basis? Is that something to be concerned about? Um, yeah, it's a good question. In general, um, what we usually see with concentrates is a loss of the terpenoids. Um, so I've as I've already mentioned, in the drying and curing process, 
um, you're losing up to half of the lower molecular weight monoterpenoids to begin with. Then that's compounded oftentimes by um, the tendency to do supercritical CO2 extraction um, in one pass. Now that's really efficient at getting the cannabinoids out, but also wastes the terpenoids. Um, you know, it'd be better to do two passes, one aimed at the terpenoid extraction and, and a, a separate one for the cannabinoids. Um, but going back to the question, can you have too much terpenoid? Yeah, the, the answer is yes. Let's use the example of pinene. Now, pinene is a, a very important agent. It actually can reverse or eliminate the short-term memory impairment from THC. But it is a little bit irritating. If the concentration were too high, it's going to be irritating to the lungs and cause cough. Um, if it were inhaled. Um, so that's a possibility. But, um, you know, a rule of thumb I like to use is follow what nature does. So let's just say for the sake of discussion, we've got a cannabis flower that tests out at 25% um, uh, THC or total cannabinoid content. What would be a reasonable corresponding content of terpenoids? Well, um, you know, there, um, we usually see something, 5% would be a great one. Um, so maybe 20% of the uh, cannabinoid content uh, would be a good figure for the terpenoid content. Usually it's much lower than that, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, but um, the key thing would be, does it produce irritation if it's inhaled? Um, there are toxicities um, to the, the uh, terpenoids found in cannabis, but usually at very high concentrations or high doses. Uh, for the most part, these are agents that are in our diets. Uh, they're often used as food supplements and are, are recognized. They're grass. Uh, that doesn't mean the stuff in the lawn. It means generally recognized as safe as food additives or flavoring agents. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're rare, rare uh, terpenoids. Um, uh, Puligone, uh, for example, um, I haven't seen it in cannabis in many years, uh, but uh, there've been uh, reports that it could produce miscarriages on at least in animal testing. Um, it's also found in pennyroyal, which isn't recommended for pregnant women, for example. Um, but in general, these are very safe compounds if used in a reasonable concentration. That's good to hear. Um, and I'm sure folks can take proper uh, where PPE is appropriate if needed. Um, get, getting on to another question, though, I want to jump back. You had mentioned one of the reasons that you did this most recent uh, extraction study, or, or sorry, a drying study with um, Jeremy was because of his facility and the fact that he uses organic production. Uh, can you explain a little more on why you feel organic production is important from a medical perspective or a therapeutic perspective? Well, first is a safety factor. Um, inorganic culture, uh, it's a given that you're not going to use pesticides. Um, and um, these are things that just shouldn't be uh, in cannabis that consumers are utilizing, um, particularly if it's inhaled, because in the same way that um, inhaling uh, cannabis smoke or vapor gets into the system very quickly, the same is gonna be true for pesticides. And in general, if something kills a bug, there's a fair chance that it's got toxicity for humans as well. Now, there are exceptions. Um, there are certain pesticides that target receptors in insects that humans don't have, but um, uh, in general, most pesticides are bad for you. Um, so there's that whole element. Um, I think that part's pretty obvious or, or logical. 
But beyond that, um, I, I can just say I've been an organic farmer myself for, geez, uh, at least 40 years. Um, it's important to me um, to know what I'm putting into my body. And I hope the same would be particularly true for people that are taking medicine. Um, uh, so there's, again, um, beyond the safety factor, I am quite convinced that um, growing plants organically is going to provide a healthier plant um, and a healthier product. Um, by healthier product, I mean that um, a happy plant is going to likely produce better medicine. And that could be in the form of higher yields of cannabinoids and terpenoids or better balance. Um, you know, we have to go back a step and ask, why does the plant make these things? Well, it wasn't put on God's green earth um, to get us high. How we know that is the human species is under a million years old and the cannabis plant is 30 million years old. Well, then you should ask the question, um, why are cannabinoids in the plant? Um, the endocannabinoid system is actually much older than that. It's um, 300 million years old. Um, so uh, the plant happens to make these things um, and it does so for ecological reasons. Um, so making these chemicals, whether they be cannabinoids or terpenoids, serves the purpose of the plant. In this instance, it is to have antibiotic effects, antifungal effects, and to discourage predation. Um, now, it's a happy accident for us um, that these chemicals that the plant's making for its own purposes happen to be very salutary, um, good for our health or enjoyment as the case may be. Um, but um, we also have to recognize that uh, things are not the same today as they've always been. What is always been with respect to human medicine was that medicine came from plants. And it's only been in about the last 75 to 100 years that we've had the capability of synthetic chemistry to make drugs uh, from scratch that in some instances, don't exist in nature. Uh, now, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I really um, am well aware of the bad things in terms of the toxicities, whereas um, medicine from a plant often, not always, but often is going to be safer and uh, easier for the system to incorporate or detoxify, as the case may be. Um, so there's that. Um, I'll stop there for a second. Yeah, the one the one thing I wanted to get back to was the the pesticide comment. We do in organic production. There are some pesticides that I still wouldn't want folks to use, even though they would qualify as organic, like erythrins, for example. Yeah, uh, you know, I I happen to know how you know Sam over at Proof and Jeremy are running their facility, and I feel quite confident in the quality of their flower. But it's a definite concern. Um, one other aspect from the cultivation perspective that you and I touched on before the podcast was this um, sort of the the microbial uh, relationship in the rhizosphere between plant root exudates and you know the microbiology that exists and how those work together in a symbiotic way to really allow the plant to control its growth. Um, you had an interesting analogy there, if you wanna share it um, in relation to humans, um, <laughs> if you wanna well, mention that. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, uh, we are humans, but we're complex organisms as well. We have a whole gut microbiome that uh, consists of trillions of bacteria. Without these, we would be in serious trouble because they are responsible for aiding digestion, reducing inflammation, and in, uh, often producing chemicals that we couldn't get from our food uh, without them. Plants are the same. Uh, plants have roots. They're going through the substrate, hopefully soil, 
um, and seeking nutrients. Um, now, they can manage this in a sterile soil. However, um, they incorporate these nutrients a lot better if there is also the presence of appropriate uh, other microbiota, usually fungi in this instance, but also bacteria. And there's a symbiosis there that um, they nourish the fungi or bacteria and in return um, get help in incorporating the nutrients that they need. Um, and a proper ecology of a cannabis plant or a tree or anything else it's going to include the plant itself plus these other agents. Um, and when those agents are present, a plant finds it a lot easier to draw what it needs. Um, and so you're going to have a healthier plant. And, you know, when a plant's really healthy, maybe you don't have the need for any of these pesticides um, or even organic controls. Um, but we make it tough uh, for cannabis in a lot of instances because um, they're in crowded conditions. Um, they usually isn't a lot of thought given to providing uh, these mycorrhizal agents that are going to help the plant be healthy. And so you've got to use all these artificial uh, agents to try and control diseases after the fact. Um, so. I mean, it's having proper nutrition of your plant um, more naturally is sort of like preventive medicine. It makes sense. I mean, one could survive on McDonald's and steroids, but you certainly wouldn't be as healthy as someone who's eating a balanced diet. Um, yeah, this and is you'd true. be more likely to get illness, be more susceptible to a variety of problems. Um, so that makes sense. Um, one, one other thing that I thought of when we were talking about uh, proof is, and Jeremy was this uh, goal he has of getting replicable chemovar expression so that uh, from, a, from a patient perspective, um, you can get a consistent response every time you consume um, a particular you know, cultivar or a particular product. How... Because the big argument I've heard for moving towards, you know, more chemicals, um, more synth more synthesized um, versions of THC is that we can get consistent, you know, pharmaceutical uh, responses or quality. Um, how do we do this from a cultivation perspective or as an organic grower? Um, yeah. And how well, does that benefit the patient? <laughs> first and foremost, I need to say that. It not only should be done, it has been done. Um, and one reason I wanted to do this, uh, the experiment of proof was so that we could highlight Jeremy's work in showing that indoor organic regenerative culture of cannabis um, was practical. Um, and beyond that, um, this is using the ultimate controlled environment. Now, uh, it would be great if we could uh, plant out outdoors under the sun and get reproducible crops. However, um, in the Pacific Northwest these days, we have wildfires uh, late in the summer, there's smoke exposure, there's dust in the air, there's stray pollen, there is pesticide contamination from your neighbor drifting over. It's not controlled. Um, and uh, this is unfortunate, but it's the truth. And it's a hard thing to avoid. Or one hailstorm can wipe out your crop. Um, let's concentrate for a second on the pharmaceutical market. To make a pharmaceutical from a plant, this has been done. It can be done again. It's got to be controlled every step of the way to get the kind of consistency that the Food and Drug Administration requires of a drug, that there's very little variance in the components from one batch to another. This is a sine qua non. If you don't have that, you don't get approved. And you have to maintain that throughout the life of the drug. Um, but this can be done. It requires that you have 
um, consistent genetics, but also consistent environment. Um, so this is best done in a greenhouse or totally indoors. Um, and in the case of indoors, um, using LED lighting, it's possible to affect the spectrum that in turn affects the expression of these chemical components. Um, so, uh, you know, it is the ultimate in scientific culture uh, for medical applications. Um, so with that though, there's all these variables that the plant is exposed to from how healthy is your mother plant, um, you know, and, and in theory, you're starting from clones. So let's say we take the same, the same clone all the way through um, round after round, you know, we'll see variances in irrigation, uh, pest pressure, all of these things, uh, nutrients will all have impact on chemovar expression, as you know. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is it, you say it's possible, how do we get that level of consistency to a point where maybe the FDA would accept, um, would accept something as, you know, as medically consistent? Well, it's already happened. Uh, it happened with Epidiolex, which is a purified CBD derived from plant. It also happened with Sativex. Sativex is, um, extracts of a high THC plant and a high CBD plant with other com uh, components, other cannabinoids and terpenoids. Although it was not approved clinically by the FDA, it did make it through the chemistry manufacturing control uh, process at FDA. What that means is the consistency was demonstrated despite the fact that there were hundreds of components. Um, so, I mean, I could show you a slide of um, 25 uh, different batches of uh, Sativex over nine years. And um, the traces superimposed look like single peaks. You can't see much variance at all. Um, now, uh, for example, in Europe, when you're making a medicine from a plant, they usually have allowed a variation plus or minus on a particular component of 10%. Medically, it's got to be better than that. Um, accepted figure now is about 5%, but um, with the FDA, I'm sure that the variance was much, much less than 5%. Um, and again, this can be done. If you have um, consistent genetics, uh, you have a uh, uh, stipulated process every step of the way. Um, you know, I can tell you at GW, it was 77 days from when the rooted cuttings went out until they were harvested, not 76, not 78. Um, they didn't use pesticides at all. Uh, when there were bugs, uh, thrips and what have you, they were dealt with through integrated pest management. Good bugs eat bad bugs. Um, and th this is all acceptable. So this has already happened. It can happen again. That's not to say that it's easy or that it's cheap. Um, but um, again, in the pharmaceutical market, you're always paying a high price for what we hope will be an effective, safe, and consistent agent. Okay. I mean, that makes, that makes sense. Um, do you see this always being an extracted product then, or do you think flour could get to a level to where we could get that kind of consistency? Sure. Well, Ted, you know, whether people like it or not, there are always going to be three echelons of activity with cannabis-based uh, products. Uh, herbal cannabis isn't going away. Um, the second echelon is supplements that hopefully uh, have some degree of standardization and quality control. And then the top tier, if you will, uh, is pharmaceutical production, which again has to uh, surpass a higher bar in terms of all these um, stipulations. Um, but these are always going to be around. Um, you know, but I, I can tell you the US federal government made a mistake in 1985 when they, um, the FDA, uh, approved synthetic THC as Marinol and thought that was going to take care of the 
whole issue of cannabis, um, herbal cannabis as medicine. That didn't happen <laughs> and it won't happen. Um, right. So we need this, we need this plant, um, <laughs> essentially is what you're saying. Yeah, and um, all its glory and all its different uh, manifestations. I, I want to touch on that with you because, uh, you know, genetic diversity in cannabis is, is massive. We're learning more and more, it seems like every day um, as to not just its effects, but what, um, what its potential is. Um, how important is the genetic diversity that we currently have in terms of preservation? And what are you most excited about um, seeing coming out of the cannabis plant? Well, uh, and that we know a lot about cannabis. However, we've only scratched the surface of what it can do therapeutically. Um, as I previously mentioned, if there are 150 known phytocannabinoids, um, people mostly these days only have access to about three in any concentration, THC and CBD. Uh, last year, our team did the first human study of cannabigerol, and it's turning out to be a fabulous agent. Um, and the same can happen for THCV and cannabidiverin and a bunch of others we could reel off the names of uh, over the next half an hour. But, um, you know, there's, there's plenty more to come. Uh, yeah, we really want to show the validity of the entourage effect. Um, and I'll make a bold statement. There are plenty of uh, clinical studies that have been done with cannabis in one form or another. Uh, however, most of them have been with very substandard material, particularly NIDA cannabis, that really creates a false impression of what the plant can do. Um, uh, I would make the statement that I don't think any studies so far have been undertaken with what I would call an optimized preparation. Um, meaning being all it could be, um, getting the right balance of therapeutic components, cannabinoids and terpenoids to do the job uh, the best way it can be done. Um, so a big part of what we're doing now at Credo Science is uh, trying to formulate for what we think are going to be better preparations. Can you talk a little bit about your company, Credo Science? Sure. Well, <clears throat> Tad, I've been at this for 26 years now and uh, working for other people, and that has its pros and cons. But, um, you know, basically at uh, the ripe age of 68, I decided that, like it or not, I had to do this myself. Uh, so, Nisha Whiteley and I uh, started Credo Science right at the start of the pandemic. Um, that set us back a while, but the idea was to develop some concepts that I'd been rattling around in my head, um, different uh, approaches to cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. Uh, so, you know, we've discussed one of these applications already, and that is the cryocave technique. Um, but we also have uh, plans for a, a cannabis based disinfectant, a cannabis treatment for head lice. Um, we have our formulation service. Um, so we're doing lots of different things. Uh, we also um, developed uh, a screening test uh, for the genetic mutations that we observed in cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Um, so it turns out that this isn't from pesticides or neem or uh, other explanations, but people that have this seem to have a genetic susceptibility um, that causes them to get sick when they're uh, using too much THC on a chronic basis. That's interesting because I have heard the, the neem comment in many forums along with a variety of other hypothesis. So it's good to hear from a, an actual doctor that that's well, not, the not case. only that I'm somebody that uses neem on my fruit and berries. Um, and uh, whether it's a good idea or not, I've eaten stuff I sprayed the same day. Um, mm. <laughs> it didn't do any harm to me. Uh, neem, like anything, 
can have toxicity. However, the toxicity we know to be attached to neem doesn't match uh, that uh, of cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome at all. Um, so people would like a different explanation. And the unfortunate truth is some people are susceptible to this. And until we find out otherwise, they shouldn't be using cannabis, uh, which can be really unfortunate for the people involved uh, because they find it extremely difficult to stop. Mm -hmm. You, you did, you did a, a whole podcast with Shango on the Shaping Fire podcast on this uh, topic. And right. I just want to mention to folks, if you're interested in more of the medical therapy side, um, I, th I think you've done six podcasts now with Shango over there over the years. Um, they're wonderful. So I highly suggest people go check those out. Um, <laughs> I just want to, I want to mention that as a resource for folks uh, before Appreciate I forget. That. Yeah. Well, um, that's really exciting. I never would have thought of using a cannabis product for head lice, for example. Um, well, it's only a 4,000 year, uh, prescription. No. Uh, this was described, um, uh, by the uh, ancient Sumerians, so in what's now Iraq, 4,000 years ago, um, you know, and it's a simple prescription, cannabis on lice, but the exact same thing is done contemporaneously in Pakistan. Um, they use fresh uh, cannabis and rub it on the head. And I think we can do this much more effectively. What we want to do is hone in on, um, you know, which components are are most efficacious, but we know already that certain phytocannabinoids and terpenoids are insecticidal. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it's a relatively straightforward set of experiments to prove the concept. Um, hmm. Well, you mentioned neem, which made me think about all the applications that we have for neem. Um, historically, I mean, I've used neem shampoo and neem toothpaste. Um, it's used as a fertilizer. It's used as a pesticide and a fungicide as a disinfectant in many cases. Um, do you think that uh, one of the main benefits you're seeing with the head lice is relation to the oils in the, in the cannabis is more of just a suffocant or does it have something like azadiractin where it has a chemical component that you feel is really yeah, it's both. Um, and in my uh, slide presentations, I show an example of what happens when aphids are on a cannabis flower. And there are two things. One is their little legs break the trichomes, and which then burst uh, and polymerize and trap the bug. So it can get killed that way. But the uh, components uh, of the trichome, cannabinoids and terpenoids, are also insecticidal. So it's mechanical. Uh, and chemical um, are the mechanisms there. So if that's the case, why do we have such a proliferation of insect problems and with flower and cannabis? I mean, once those trichomes come in, how come, you know, yeah. hemp russet well, or even the cannabis yes, aphid yes. are so successful? Sure. Well, part of it's monoculture, you know, uh, it, you know, often uh, in nature, a uh, plant is growing with other plants and um, it may seek out things that help protect it, companion planting, if, if you will. But the other thing, and I think this is important, we have a lot of culture of plants that aren't in the right environment. So you've got people that are trying to grow um, Afghani genetics in a humid uh, climate uh, where you know, Afghanistan's pretty dry. Um, so some of its maladaption of the particular uh, chemovar genetically to where it's trying to be grown. And again, nutrition really enters in. I think a lot of these plants that are subject to insect attack are, are not getting what they need from their substrate. Um, and, uh, and again, if it were uh, a rich soil, uh, with all the necessary bacteria and fungi, I think it's going to be much less likely that be subject to the same level of, of predation and damage. 
Yeah, I would I would agree with that to an extent. I do think that we see in controlled environment agriculture when we're indoors too, you don't have natural enemies. So we don't have the the natural biocontrols for a lot of these pests. So once one enters a facility, um, it's much harder to remove. Whereas yeah. out in nature, you wouldn't have those same issues. Um, exactly. Right now I have a fruit tree outside, for example, with aphids, but yet my entire garden is not infested with them. They're primarily on this one plant and they're not even covering the entire tree. They're just covering a portion of the tree. So um, there's, there's just natural ways outdoors that these things are more controlled for. So they don't necessarily kill the plant because it's not necessarily in the pests interest from a survival perspective to, to kill a plant. Uh, it needs something to continue to eat that, that food source. So very true. I could, I could see that being the case. Um, wonderful. Well, was there anything else that you wanted to touch on in regards to uh, some of the, the research you've been working on that you'd like to share with listeners? Uh, no, I think we probably covered it. I would just like, again, to make a pitch to people for the idea that, yes, you can do uh, organic regenerative culture of cannabis um, and even indoors. Uh, and I hope that people will use your products. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time looking at ingredients and things I use, and I'm not sure I've ever seen products uh, better balanced, uh, having the things I'd like to see. Um, and I've seen the results in terms of what cannabis looks like when it has this kind of substrate available. So, uh, boy, there's no more compelling evidence than that. We'll have to get you some soil for your garden. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I didn't, I, I, I didn't quite do it this season, but next season I'm, I'm looking at uh, getting some uh, raised beds put in. And uh, yeah, it's important to me what goes in. I might try a little hugel quilter, but uh, we need uh, wonderful, good wonderful. Otherwise, too. Yeah, we've been working now with uh, Jeremy and Sam over at Proof for um, a year or two with uh, providing them with media, with, with soil. And that's been a really wonderful experience because of all the data collection they do. We're really able to refine and improve our processes uh, because of the feedback that we're getting from them. Um, one thing that some of the other facilities that we work with are doing, and I know uh, proof is starting to experiment with is this idea of reusing the media too in the facility, uh, which can lead to some challenges around consistency. As, as you know, every time you harvest a plant, you're pulling out organic matter, you're pulling out nutrients, those have to be replaced. So um, replacing them to the exact levels that they were at before and keeping the biology, you know, consistent to what it was to get that same ex chemo of our expression is, is really challenging, but we do have some facilities that have been reusing soil now for, oh, five to eight years in some cases at five cycles a, a year indoors, um, quite successfully with good yields. So it's, uh, I really, I, I hope and think that's really the future from a sustainability perspective of how we're going to cultivate, um, not just from a cost and labor perspective, but also just from a environmental perspective as well, so. Excited for that. Yes, it sounds very promising. <laughs> well, I thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you at another event uh, locally as well. You picked, you picked the best year not to garden because we are having historically cold weather this year. Um, it's noticed. been a gardener's nightmare. <laughs> Certainly noticed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you again and have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. That was Dr. Ethan Russo and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. If you like the podcast, please leave us a rating and review and give us a follow on Instagram. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage to stay up to date on the latest research and information. Thanks for listening.